today. I'm Mike Lewis. I'm the pastor here at Bethlehem United Methodist Church and at Highbury United Methodist Church, and we welcome all of you joining us online this morning. We're glad to have you tuning in. Uh, by way of announcements, next Sunday is July the 4th, and we will be having church as usual at the normal times, uh, 10 o'clock at Highburger and 11 o'clock at Bethlehem. And uh, so I want you to be a part of that. And then two weeks from today on July the 11th, we are having our annual homecoming. And it's really big this year because we are going to be in our brand new fellowship hall for the first time. And we will be dedicating it on that day. We'll have dinner on the grounds, as we say, dinner after church. We will be having it at our new air-conditioned fellowship hall. So we're very excited about that. So you're welcome to join us. Uh, begin at 11 o'clock for worship. We will have uh, communion during that worship service. And then afterwards, we'll go over to our new fellowship hall for great potluck lunch and um, dedication of our new bill. Okay? So I hope you'll invite your friends and family and, and everybody's welcome to come and be a part of that. Are there any other announcements we need to make? Okay, then if you would stand please and let's begin our worship this morning with our responsive call to worship. Loving God, let your word speak to our hearts. Comfort our grieving hearts. Teach us to share from your abundance. And if you'll get your Methodist hymnal and turn to 470. <laughs> crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You can be seated. Uh, this past week, I had Lee Allen come and visit for a couple of days. <clears throat> Every year, his wife has her sisters come and 
stay with her for a week and so Lee looks for a chance to get out of the house and go somewhere and give them time to visit together. Um, so he came and uh, while he was here driving in the car talking as we do, he said, you know, I've been watching your service online and did you know you've been saying the uh, affirmation of faith wrong, the Apostles' Creed? And I said, no, I didn't know that. How have we been saying it wrong? <clears throat> And he said, it's not supposed to be, he arose from the dead, but he rose from the dead. Did y'all know that? I didn't know that. He may not be right about that. <laughs> I'm going to check it out. <laughs> but anyway, we'll find out one way or another if, it, if it's a rose or rose. Um, either way, it means the same thing, doesn't it? Huh? That's right. <laughs> he said it rose by any other name. Uh, <clears throat> let's remember to pray for those folks down in Florida. That horrific um, building collapse. Can't even imagine. And pray for those rescue workers with that sad job. Uh, also pray for the people out west that are going through severe droughts and crops are failing. And pray for rain for them. What else do you guys want to mention for prayer this morning? Chuck got our new uh, redid the, our sign for our new hours on the church. Oh, wow. Great. Please remember now my home. Uh, Larry's mother, she fell down in the surgery. Still have to have surgery there. I think better so in the blood test for the old and blood that was there. So she did have to have surgery? Yes, she still has to have surgery. Oh, she's going to have surgery. Amen. Okay, take a moment at this time to go before the Lord in your silent prayers. And then I'll I'll pray. Lead us in our prayer. Lord, as we bow before you as a congregation here and wherever pe people might be as they join us online this morning, we want to acknowledge to you, Lord, that we are weak, we are frail. Lord, we are in need of you in our lives. Father, we come before you recognizing our weakness and frailty and our failures and shortcomings. God, we thank you for your mercy towards us, your grace. And God, we confess our sins and ask you to forgive us and cleanse us from our sins. And Lord, renew a right spirit within us. Create a clean heart within us. Father, we know that we are your ambassadors in this world. We know that we are your co-workers. And Lord, uh, you know that that's not easy in this world. Never has been, probably never will be until you come again. 
So God, have mercy on us. Thank you that we could come in worship to know that you're here with us. You're ready to meet us here. You're ready to not only forgive us and cleanse us from sin and fill us with your spirit, but to realign our lives according to your good will for us and for this world. God, uh, our hearts are heavy this, this morning for the people down in Florida. We pray for those families in their grief and in their uncertainty. We pray for the rescue workers that are having to do such a horrific, hard job. We pray for that community, for those churches that are ministering. We also pray for people that are suffering from the drought and the heat out in the West. God, that you'd bring rain, bring relief to them for their crops. We do pray for our nation, Lord. We still are being ravaged by divisiveness. We pray that we can have righteous leadership for justice and peace. We pray for our leaders, national, state, local, that they would lead us with wisdom. God, we pray that you bring a healing to our nation. And Lord, we pray for churches around the world today, many of them looking at the same scripture passage that we're going to be looking at today. We pray that you would strengthen your churches and cause all of us to be more effective and fruitful in our service. So God, thank you that we could be here with you today in worship. We lift up these that were mentioned for prayer. Pray that you would be with them in their illnesses and in their treatments to bring healing. And God, we thank you for those that have improved. And uh, we thank you for answered prayer. Lord, we pray all these things in the name of Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now turn to 299. O Zion haste. <laughs> Thank you. 
2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians 8. In your pew Bible, it's page 1799. 2 Corinthians 8, starting in verse 7. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also sell, excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work, so that your eagerness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. This is the word of the Lord. come before you, Lord, in humility and with gratitude. Lord, you've lavished your love upon us, and thank you that you have been faithful to us. And Lord, as we come bringing these tithes and offerings as an act of worship, we do so gratefully. We trust you to use these tithes and offerings for your good work through this church and this community and also around the world. Thank you, Lord. Bless and prosper it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. second Sunday we met at 11 o'clock for worship uh, y'all know what I had to do this morning I had to write myself a note and stick it on my steering wheel at Highburger so that when I got out and got in my car I wouldn't drive towards Selma so I put a note and stuck it in my steering wheel that says Bethlehem I told Gaynell she needed to help me remember every Sunday. She said, no, you don't count on me. <laughs> well, we're creatures of habit, aren't we? But I appreciate y'all making the adjustment and helping us get the word out. And, and in a few weeks, my car will know where to go after Heidberger. 
and uh, it'll just happen automatically. Uh, <clears throat> glad you're all here for um, church today. You know, uh, when we're going through whole parts of a book of the Bible like we're doing now with 2 Corinthians, I consider it to be kind of like uh, mining for diamonds in a diamond mine. I've never actually done that, <laughs> but what I know about it and seen on TV and so forth is that they're down in those coal mines and they're digging up the, the earth and they're looking for, of course, diamonds. Well, I feel like going through a book of the Bible is kind of like that because, you know, uh, 2 Corinthians is a letter that was specifically directed towards one church in Corinth. Paul had been instrumental in that church being started and established there. Uh, and what he did anytime after he moved on to another place to start another church was he kept up with those churches. He prayed for them. He loved them. It was, it was very much on his mind and heart that he wanted to disciple them. He wanted them to do well. And uh, so he's writing this letter to this church at Corinth. But we know that the Bible is inspired by God, right? Profitable for teaching. So it's for us as well. The same things that he wanted that church to learn and to do, to be, he wants for us. Uh, even 2,000 years later in a different part of the world, speaking a different language, he still wants us to have instilled in us the same spirit, the same understanding, the same um, uh, desire to serve the Lord and to, to be effective for him. So, so as he's writing this uh, important letter, we have much to learn. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, remember, he reminded us, he reminded them and through them, us as well, that we are ambassadors for Christ. That's who we are. Those of us that have received Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, now we represent him in this world. And so we're his ambassadors. We want to accurately, authentically <coughs> demonstrate to the people in the world who Christ is by our attitudes, actions, showing, sharing the love of Christ appropriately. We also have the message of reconciliation. We learned a couple of weeks ago, the same message that Jesus had. He wants to reckon, we want to reconcile people to God by faith in Christ, right? And we want people to be reconciled to one another. We're God's peacemakers. And last week, we were reminded from the scriptures that we are God's co-workers. So those are some pretty important things to know about who we are in Christ and uh, how we're supposed to be living our lives. Well, we're not going to go through chapter 7. The lectionary doesn't touch on that one. But in chapter 7, there's good news because remember Paul was writing this letter to the church of Corinth because there were some issues that needed to be resolved, some conflicts and, and different things. Well, the good news from chapter 7 is that they responded well. They took his word. Uh, Paul had sent Titus with the message to them, the letter. And in chapter 7, we learned that Titus was happy uh, because of their response. He says his spirit was refreshed by the Corinthians, by their response to Paul's teachings and admonitions. So he was very happy about the results and he portrayed that back to Paul. And verse 16 in chapter seven, Paul says, I'm glad I can have complete confidence in you. So now Paul's confidence in this church has been restored and he has complete confidence in them. So now we get into chapter eight and he's now using this opportunity to teach this church something vitally important, and that is something that our church needs to learn that's vitally important, and every church needs to learn and understand and apply to their current local situations. He says in chapter 8, Now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know that the grace of God has been given to the Macedonian churches. The Macedonian churches were the church at Philippi, the Philippians, the church at Thessalonica, the Thessalonians, we have those letters in our 
Bible as well. So he's saying, I want you to know about the grace that God has given to those churches and how these churches have been generous in their giving to the church at Jerusalem. Now, this is a situation. The church at Jerusalem was the mother church, right? That's where it all started. Jesus' brother was pastor there, James. Uh, but they were going through some really, really difficult times. Very hard times. Affliction. Poverty. So these other churches that Paul had started uh, were now contributing to help the church at Jerusalem. They wanted to do it. They, they, they were glad to do it. They were willing to do it. And they had contributed. And so now Paul is reminding the church at Corinth that they had also contributed and made a, made a pledge in a way. And so Paul was going back and encouraging them to follow through on their giving because the church at Jerusalem still had a severe need. So the Bible tells us about these, what we would call Macedonian churches in that region, the Greek churches, is that they were giving even though they themselves were in the midst of great trials of affliction. So it's not like everything was smooth and easy for these churches and everything was wealthy so they could give something to help the church of Jerusalem. No, they were struggling themselves. But the church of Jerusalem had an even greater need. So these churches, even though they were in, the, in a condition the Bible calls a great trial of affliction in 8.2, they were still willing, eager, steadfast in giving to help the church of Jerusalem. Well, their example shows us some things, right? First of all, it shows us that it's possible for us to remain steadfast and faithful to the Lord and to his service, even when we are experiencing trials in our own church, in our own life. You know, <laughs> I don't have to tell y'all, life is hard. We go through hard times, don't we? We go through trials and tribulations and afflictions, and some of those are severe. Very severe. Churches go through hard times, too. Churches go through, go through difficult times. There's churches that burn down, destroyed by tornadoes, hurricanes, you know. Um, churches that have horrible things happen um, in their congregations. Uh, and so churches go through hard times as well. And that's something that we're not surprised by. The Bible never promises us that because we're Christians, we're, we're just going to have smooth sailing. You know, it doesn't say that. It says, in the world you will have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. So, so we're going to go through hard times as individuals, as families, as churches. But even so, it's possible for us to remain steadfast and faithful in the service of the Lord, right? We don't just stop doing what God has saved us for and called us for because we're going through a hard time. Well, these churches are going through hard times themselves, but even so, they were being faithful to help others. And the thing about it that's surprising in a good way is that the, Paul tells us that these churches had abundant joy even though they were afflicted. Abundant joy, even though they were afflicted. Now, these weren't crazy people. They weren't joyful because of the affliction, but they were joyful, abundantly joyful, even though they were going through affliction because of what Christ had done for them, right? Because of the the grace of God that had been lavished upon them. They were so grateful that now they were saved by faith. They were now welcomed into the family of God to be the children of God because of God's grace, because God sent Jesus. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life, and they had. So they were so grateful for their salvation. They were so grateful that now they were 
included in the family of God. They were no longer strangers, but now they were household members. So they were so grateful that even though they were afflicted, they were experiencing abundant joy. And even James, who was the pastor of the church at Jerusalem, Jesus' brother, he said in James 1, verses 2 to 3, Consider it pure joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. It's a very important passage, isn't it? Now, he didn't say consider it pure joy because of the trial. He said, consider it pure joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. In other words, we're going to go through tough times as individuals, as families, as churches, but we know because we are God's people, his ambassadors, his co-workers, his family, we know that God is going to be with us and that we are going to grow through those trials. You know that old saying, whatever doesn't kill us makes us stronger? Well, if you're a Christian person following Christ, if you're a church that's true, faithful to the Lord, then that is true. What, whatever trial you have to go through is going to make you stronger, more able to endure. And endurance is something to be highly valued. That's why a lot of you are still faithful to Christ at this age in your life, even though you came to know Christ at an early stage as a young person, you've been able to endure through hard times, through times of testing, trial, difficulties, afflictions. And the Bible tells us that these churches, Philippians, Thessalonians, these Macedonian churches, they themselves were experiencing deep poverty. Remember, in those times, they didn't have, like, government resources. They didn't have, like, welfare and Medicare and unemployment compensation. They didn't have all those things. So if, you're, if, the, if your husband died or your dad died or your brothers died, you could be left as a widow and, and be very poor. Remember Naomi and Ruth in the Bible? Uh, so there was a lot of deep poverty in those days. There was deep poverty in these churches because they were just common people coming to know Christ and joining the church. But Paul says they gave liberally. They gave generously. You remember just like the lady gave her what is might? She gave what she could, what she had. Well, when we learn about these churches, we really, we really are impressed. We marvel at them because they were simultaneously going through great afflictions, but they were still joyful. They were in poverty, but they gave generously. That's the way Christians are, isn't it? That's why Christians are remarkable and such good witnesses in the world because we don't wait until everything is perfect in our own lives or in our own churches before we reach out to help other people. Hurricane Bob was a Category 3 hurricane in 1991. It was the second named hurricane that year. It was the only hurricane that year that made landfall. But it came right up the coast of the United States. It uh, decreased to a Category 2, but made a direct hit at Block Island, Rhode Island, and Newport, Rhode Island. Then it came right on up past Swansea, where our church was. Uh, on the outskirts of Fall River, Massachusetts. So it made a, a direct path across our church, where our church was. I lived, my house was on the bay. The church was a block from the coast. We were on a peninsula surrounded on three sides by the Mount Hope Bay. So the police came and made us uh, evacuate. We didn't have a choice. And we all went to the, to the high school, which was a concrete, well-built, brick building and we were there for the duration of the hurricane which lasted of course many hours 
And because of the eye came across our church where we were, um, the wind blew one direction, blew trees down. We could see it out the window. And then all of a sudden everything cleared up. We were in the eye of the hurricane. It was eerie because you could look up and see a blue sky. And then the second part of the hurricane, the backside came across and the wind was blowing in the opposite direction. So some of the trees that blew down blew back up. <laughs> it was almost like watching the video in reverse. So it was really an eerie uh, experience to go through that. But when we got out and began to drive around, of course, it looked like a different world. It looked like uh, a bomb had gone off. Uh, 18 people died in that hurricane. It was $3 billion worth of damage. Um, it spawned seven tornadoes. And some of those tornadoes were severe, especially out on Cape Cod. So I'm telling you that to tell you that uh, I got a call as a pastor of that church later that, that, that night, actually. And it was our um, equivalent to district superintendent calling and saying that they had a group of disaster relief men that wanted to come and help and could we house them, host them. And I said, well, we do our best. I mean, I, I didn't know how many were coming or what it was gonna be like. So we cleaned out, our, our church had stackable chairs and we got them all out of the way and we set up cots. Um, dozens and dozens of people came. I don't even know the number, but it was a lot. The fire department down the street, uh, we had them like two blocks away agreed to let everybody come and use their showers during their time. They began to get up, they got up before dawn every morning, worked all day till dark, uh, sawing down trees, cleaning up debris, uh, doing all those things that have to be done immediately after a hurricane or a tornado. Uh, Red Cross came and set up in our parking lot, started preparing hot meals. Um, Police set up temporary headquarters in our church, danced the phones. It was quite an operation. But as a young pastor, I was pretty, pretty impressed and amazed. These guys that were coming to help were from churches in Kentucky. I'd never, I'd never met any of them. I didn't know even about their churches. But they came simply because they wanted to help. Um, they came and gave out of their self-sacrifice. Um, and these weren't supermen, they were just common guys, but they wanted to come and do what they could do and it made a huge impression on our community, as you can imagine, uh, on the police, fire department, but also on the community at large. But they came and they helped and I thought of them when I was reading this because the church in Jerusalem was in a bad way and the other churches wanted to help. You know, uh, the thing about this too is that the church at Jerusalem was made up mostly of converted Jews, remember? So they were Jewish converts. The churches that Paul started in the Macedonian region were mostly Greeks. So when these uh, Greek people, non-Jewish people came to know Christ, Paul didn't require them to observe Jewish customs like circumcision or ritual washings and those type things that were part of the Jewish religion. But the church of Jerusalem still practiced some of those things. So think about it. These Greek Christians, churches, were now helping a church in Jerusalem, mostly Jewish Christians. They didn't even worship the same. They disagreed about some theological issues. But did that stop them from being willing to help? No, it didn't. You know those guys that came to help from Kentucky uh, up at my church in Massachusetts? Not one of them ever asked if they agreed with us 100% theologically. Never, not once. They didn't ask any people they helped out of the community. Were they Christians? Were they Catholics? Were they Jews? Were they Muslims? Were they, you know, Sikhs or any other faith? Didn't, just helped them. Paul really wanted these churches all over to be one big happy family. He really did. He wanted them all to help each other. He said that, you know, now you're helping out of your relative abundance because they have a greater need, but there will come a day when they will probably want, need to help you. 
And that's the way this thing works. And he quotes that scripture, you know, about manna, when people would have to go out and pick up manna every day. And the Jewish people, when they were making their way to the promised land, the manna fell from heaven every day, remember? And they had to pick up enough for that day every day. That's why we pray, give us this day a daily bread. And some people picked up too much, and some people didn't pick up enough. But they shared it all so that everybody had equality. And now Paul wants it to work that way with the churches. You know, churches really should love other churches, shouldn't we? We're not in competition. We're not. Bethlehem United Methodist Church can't possibly reach everybody. You know, we won't appeal to the same. Some people have different tastes and worship and different things. So we need other churches to be healthy, to prosper. Isn't it the sign of a healthy church that you want other churches to be healthy also? Of course it is. And you know, a lot of churches around the world are going through horrible afflictions. There are churches in communist countries churches where there's dictatorships, where they have to worship underground, right? They have to worship in secret or they would be persecuted or killed. So there's churches all over that are in, in dire straits and we need to be concerned about those churches prospering, being strong wherever they might be. So think about what we could all do, what we churches could do if we all everywhere work together and help one another and we do there's a lot of ways in which we do that and i'm grateful one last story when i started the church in huntington indiana my first church after i graduated from seminary our office again kind of like the district superintendent office contacted me and they said there's a, a church in decatur georgia that has a foundation called the Guy Rutna Foundation, and they set up that foundation to help new churches get started, and they want to help you start your church in Huntington, Indiana. So they're committing to $18,000 a year for two years to help you get started. Well, at the time, my whole salary was $12,000 per year. <laughs> so 18,000 per year for two years sounded really good, and they did that. Uh, and the good thing about it was with, within that two-year period, our church grew rapidly, and by the end of that, we were self-supporting. So we never had to receive any money from the, from the convention, from the denomination. Uh, that's why they liked our church so much. <laughs> uh, but the, the people from First Baptist, the cater, came up and were with us on the day that we constituted, became an official church. And we were, all, we're always grateful for what they've done. But they never met me. They never knew about Huntington, Indiana. All they knew was that they wanted to help start churches wherever there needed to be a new church started. And that's the kind of spirit I believe we need to have as a church. I believe we need to have a generous spirit wanting to help others, not only concerned about our health and prosperity, but concerned about the health and prosperity of others. So Paul is talking about giving in this passage, and we can apply it to ourselves and our own giving. But he's also talking about the church and the attitude that we need to have, that now we want to be a church that helps others. We've been established, we've built buildings, we've done things here, and now how can we look around and see how we could help churches all over? Would you pray with me? Lord, I'm grateful for the history and legacy of the Methodists in this country and around the world. I know that the legacy that has been passed on to us is that Wesley and others traveled around to start churches in the, every, every town that was established in the United States so there would be a new church. And I know that this church, Bethlehem United Methodist Church, was the recipient of such a, a movement a missionary movement, a church planting movement, so that this church was established here with a mission to go and to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to every person, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that God has commanded us, and remembering that you're with us always. 
Well, Lord, here we are many years later, and our church is continuing to fulfill our calling, finding new ways, discovering new ways that we might be relevant and fruitful and effective in reaching people. God bless us as we do that, as we follow your leadership. But then, Lord, also use us to be a strong enabler and encourager of other churches in our state, in our nation, and around the world. Show us what we can do to be a part of your great movement, Lord, to be a part of your big happy family, all of us fulfilling your will until your kingdom comes on earth as it, as it is in heaven. Thank you, God, and we pray these things in the name of Christ for his sake. Amen. Now, if you'll turn in your hymn book to 306, 306, and let's stand and sing, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. church that's represented by people watching online. Lord, thank you that we could be a part of this church and the churches that are doing your work. And God, we pray that you would use us. We pray that we could be a strong link in the chain. And God, that uh, our effectiveness could bleed out into the effectiveness of churches around us. So God, thank you. Thank you for speaking to us by your spirit today. May we take it to heart and live it out in our daily lives. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.